Please turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. We are studying this great epistle and Peter has written to us, telling us, reminding us that we don't fit here, that we are outsiders. And when we come to faith in Christ, it might be the same old world, but it's a brand new us and we're different. We are strangers. We're exiles. We are ambassadors, if you will, of another kingdom. We serve another king. We have another purpose. And that means that sometimes we're going to find ourselves at odds uh, with this world. And so he's been telling us how to live as an outsider in that way. And in fact, he told us, we saw last week, beginning in verse 7, that the end of all things is at hand. We are in the last days. We're in the last hours of the last days. We're in the last minutes of the last hours of the last days. And I think we're in the last seconds of the last minutes of the last hours of the last days. The end of all things is at hand, and that should shape the way we live and the way we love and minister to one another, what the church looks like, what our purpose is. But he warns us that with that, since indeed we're strangers, we're exiles, we're outsiders, that it is inherent we're going to suffer. We're going to have problems. We're not always going to be patted on the back. We're not always going to feel welcomed in this world. And so he says in verse 12 of chapter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a, a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Now, when I read this, I am reminded that uh, problems as a result of following Christ are the norm. Now, let me, let me tell you, this morning as I preach, I'm, sometimes I say I'm not going to preach very long, but this morning it's, it's really true uh, because there is a plane that I have to catch. Uh, so uh, I'm, I, if, if uh, I finish a little early, and I'll go ahead and beg your uh, indulgence and apologize, especially to our guest. I love to stand around and greet people after, but when I'm done today, I'm heading to the airport. Uh, our, we, uh, they're not going to hold that plane for me. Uh, and you pray for us as we go. Now, next Sunday, by way of commercial, uh, a group is going to be here, This Hope, a tremendous uh, Christian singing group going to be here. And Brother Chris will be preaching. But uh, I, I'm going to be praying for you, and I want you to pray for me and be here next week. Uh, and hear this hope and Brother Chris preach. And I will miss you, but I'll be preaching next Sunday in, in Birmingham, England. But you know, it doesn't matter if you're in the United States or Romania or England. If you're a Christian, you're going to, you're going to have some problems. You're going to have to suffer. In fact, that's exactly what he says. Don't be surprised by suffering and problems. Don't think that some strange thing has happened to you when you've given your life to Christ and yet you still have tragedy and you have sorrow and there are people that don't rejoice that you have found a, a hope and a love in Jesus Christ. He says, don't think that's a strange thing. Now, I, I, I want to be honest with you and we want to understand that he's not talking here about all suffering. And to that end, let me remind you that uh, I, you're going to face three kinds of suffering and problems. And let me just tell you what the first two are so we can get to the third one because that's his primary concern. You know, there is what I call common suffering that happens simply because of the fall. We live in a, a fallen world. We live in a world 
that is uh, not right. In fact, there's nothing in this world that is as it should be. Everything, even God's good gifts to us, are somehow defaced and marred by the fall. God gave marriage and procreation to Adam and Eve before the fall, and yet a lot of problems and a lot of trials in your life will come from your marriage if you're married and your children if you're a parent. Those are good gifts of God, but they come with problems, and that's because of the fall. Job said, man that is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. Uh, remember the curse. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. You know, the, the thorns and the thistles are pictures of the fall. It was not by accident that when he was crucified, Jesus had to wear a crown of thorns. Nothing could picture more the way that he had to bear the curse of fallenness even when he went to the cross. And in fact, you think about it, one of the worst things that could ever happen to humanity is if God had allowed us to stay in the Garden of Eden. Because if here we are, broken and separated from God by sin, and yet if we lived in a wonderful Garden of Eden, in a world that was itself not fallen, there would be nothing that would drive us to Him. It's why we need to meet people in their needs. It's why we need to have a ministry to reach people in their brokenness, both their physical brokenness and their spiritual brokenness and their sexual brokenness and, and all forms of brokenness because it is the, the pain, the grief that this fallen world brings that makes us seek Christ. We know things aren't like they ought to be. You know, we lose loved ones. We, we feel pain and we grow old and we get diseased and we have all kinds of issues and problems that are common suffering. It's not like we did anything to get that in our lives, but it's, it's a part of being in a fallen world. There's also consequential suffering because of sin. You know, God was very clear in the Word that whatsoever you sow, that you shall also what? Reap. God's law of sowing and reaping comes into effect in our lives. So, so many times we find ourselves eating the bitter fruit that has sprung from our own planted seeds of disobedience. Uh, we drink poison water from wells that we ourselves have dug. It's not like God's sitting up in heaven just waiting to hit us with a lightning bolt every time we mess up. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to judge us. Our own actions bring sorrow and grief in our lives. And a lot of the problems we have in life is because we messed up. We have sinned. And uh, forgiveness, you know, when you come to Christ and you get forgiven of your sin, that doesn't mean that you don't anymore have to face the consequences of that. Forgiveness doesn't cancel out. God's law of sowing and reaping. If, let's say a man is drinking, he gets drunk, and he's operating heavy equipment, and uh, because he's drinking on a job, and that heavy equipment chops off his arm, and later he comes to faith in Christ, and he realizes that he was a sinner, and, and, and he confesses that, and he's forgiven for that, but his arm doesn't grow back. He's, he's still got to face the consequences of that. Think about David the great king, and David sinned with Bathsheba. He committed adultery, committed murder. And you can read in Psalm 51 his great prayer of confession. God forgave him. He still called him a man after his own heart. But you look at the consequences of that sin in David's life from then on until the very end of his life. Uh, whatever you sow, that you will also reap and you can't sow your wild oats six days a week and then come to church on Sunday and pray for crop failure. You, you're going to reap what you sow. In fact, he touches on that here. Did you notice? He says, if any of you suffer as a, a murderer or a thief 
an evildoer or, and here's an interesting word, or a meddler. A meddler. Now, the, here's the fascinating thing about that. Where some, in some translations, they translate it busybody or different things. But you know what? It, it's, it's from two Greek words. One means bishop. You know, when the, the Bible says that if a man desires the office of a bishop or an overseer, he desires a good thing, that's half of this word. The other half is the word for other. So in other words, if you, if you are a bishop of somebody else's business, if you are an overseer of someone else's business, if, if you're always meddling around in things that don't concern you, it's, it's, Peter says that's going to add to your sorrow because uh, you're, there's going to be a grief in your life because you're a meddler. One reason you're suffering so much just might be that you're concerning yourself with stuff that's not your business. That's a warning that he gives us. Things that aren't your responsibility. He says here that there is a suffering that comes because we're sinners. A murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a, a meddler. And the ultimate suffering that comes from sin, of course, is death. Because we're sinners, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Because the entire race is fallen and broken, death has passed upon all, we're spiritually dead, and our entire lives are spent in anticipation of the moment when physical death will, will, will take us. Now, death is consequential, but it's not natural. Sometimes we say so-and-so died a natural death. You know, in one sense, there's no such thing as a natural death. God did not create us to die. He created us to live. He breathed into man the breath of life. Man became a living soul. It was only sin that has separated us from God and has brought death into our lives. And so God's plan was that man might live forever, but sin has separated us from him. Death has been caused by man's sin and rebellion. So there is suffering that is common. It's the result of the fall. There's suffering that's consequential. It's the result of our, our sin. But what Peter really concerns himself with here is Christian suffering. That's the suffering that we endure because of Christ. That's what he's talking about in verse 13, and 14, and especially verse 16. You know, sometimes we think that any suffering in our life is what well, we, we sort of call it our cross to bear. Oh, you know, I've got, a, I've got a terrible wife, but I guess that's just my cross to bear. No, that's not your cross to bear. She might be cross, but she's not your cross. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, what was he talking about? He was talking about dying to yourself in order to live for him. You know, you say, if you think your husband's your cross to bear, here's the reality. Even, a, even an unsaved woman could marry your husband and have to put up with him. That's, that's not suffering as a Christian. What he's talking about is suffering that happens because of your relationship to Christ. Because you follow Christ. Because you accept his word. Because you live out his precepts. In fact, in verse 16... That word if could really be translated when, yet when anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Jesus has told us all along that if we follow him, we're going to suffer. Matthew, in, in, in chapter 5, verse 11, there in the Sermon on the Mount, right in the, the opening part, in what we call the Beatitudes, what's the last thing Jesus says there? Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. That's going to happen. When you get serious about following Jesus, when you aren't a part of this world, when you're an outsider, when you have faith in him, there are going to be times that your faith is tried through the fire of persecution and suffering. Paul told Timothy, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus, will suffer persecution. All 
who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now that begs a question, doesn't it? Are you living godly in Christ Jesus? If you are, then you will suffer. And if you aren't suffering any kind of persecution, if, if it's not cost you anything to follow Christ, you better ask yourself whether or not you are, in fact, following Christ. You know, uh, I, I know what it is to be lied about. I know what it is to be trolled on the Internet because of uh, stands that I have taken. I know what it is to be hated. I know what it is to be called names and uh, falsely accused. But I'll tell you this, God has made it up to me 10,000 times 10,000 because whatever the world may say about me, God has given me himself. And it is far better to have Christ than to have the world patting you on the back and saying, oh man, you're a good guy. If you aren't suffering for the cause of Christ, then you aren't living for the cause of Christ. It, it, it's going to cost you something because you're not of this world. And Jesus lived a holy life, a perfect life. And what happened to him? See, I, I, I fear today that Christians today have become diplomats, not soldiers. We specialize in liaisons, not loyalty. We are expected to get along with anybody and everybody, including the devil himself. And that simply won't happen. If you will live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. Let a Christian stand against abortion. Let a Christian take a stand on sexual ethics and morality and, and just see what happens. Uh, it is out of step with the age and with the God of this world. Peter says, don't think it's strange. You know, don't, don't be shocked. Don't be hurt. Don't be wounded. And, and don't avoid it. It's unavoidable. If you are living for Jesus Christ, you will suffer persecution. He says that if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. And so I've got to ask, if you aren't suffering as a Christian, why not? Your faith will be tried in the fire. And the only reason you've not been in the fire is if you have no faith to be tried. But if you have faith in Jesus Christ, it shapes everything. Now, Peter has told us, don't think it's strange. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. So how do we respond? When we take a stand for Jesus Christ in high school, on the job, in the military, uh, in the community, when we say the things that are not popular, that people just think, oh, we, we can relegate that part of the Bible to the ash heap of history. Oh, you're on the wrong side of history. And they say all those things, and we just, we believe Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We believe his word doesn't change. We think it's clear. God has clearly expressed his will and his word. And so the fire comes. We're accused. We're, we're hated. Sometimes we're persecuted. In some places in the world, physically persecuted. Well, how should I pray? What should I pray when I suffer for Christ? What do I ask God for? Well, uh, Peter's first concern is that, that we should ask God for sanctification like Christ. In verse 12, he says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening. It's, it's a fiery trial. But what kind of fire? Well, it's a refiner's fire. Remember what he said in verse 1 of chapter 4? Look back at it if you want to. He said, Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Remember, he told us in chapter 3, verse 18, Christ also suffered once for sin. 
And so then he tells us, in verse 1 of chapter 4, that when you have had to suffer, it, it makes you holy. It, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sins. There's nothing like persecution to purify the church. You know, when you have a when it, when it, when you think you're the moral majority, when you think, well, we go to church because everybody goes to church. If you want to do business in our community, you got to go to church and meet people and network and. And that's the reason people go to church, and that's the reason people get baptized and join the church is because well, everybody does it, and it's the thing to do, and it's the popular culture. There are going to be an awful lot of people who aren't real believers. They're there for all kinds of bad reasons, but they're not there for Jesus. But you let a little persecution start coming. You let people start calling your names. Let people start trolling you on the internet. I, I had my name put up on a, an, a list this week of, of uh, leaders who signed what was called the Nashville Statement. They, they put my name up and my address and my Twitter handle and uh, my phone number and everything else and, and an encouragement to get people to do nothing but harass me. Well, I'm going to tell you what. That's so what? You know, so... People say bad things about me on Twitter or call my cell phone or whatever. That, that's Man, I've been where people suffer for Christ. And saying something bad about me on Twitter just doesn't quite get to that level. Let, let's just be honest here. We might be unpopular, but we're not really suffering. Can we, and, and let's not fear it. Let's not fear that. Peter says there's going to be a fiery trial. But you know what it's going to do? It's going to purify the church. Once it becomes not the popular thing, not the end thing, not the place where business is conducted and transacted and you meet people you can sell insurance to and all that kind of thing. When it becomes countercultural for you to go to a church that preaches the pure gospel of Jesus Christ and stands on the unadulterated word of God there aren't going to be many false professors around then it purifies us it purifies your life Job said in Job 23 10 when he has tried me I shall come forth as gold Malachi said he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi we're a kingdom of priests and Jesus allows us to go through fiery trials to purify us. So when your faith is on fire, all that's going to do is burn out the dross and the impurity so that the value and beauty of the gold can be seen. You remember the old hymn, How Firm a Foundation? There's a verse in it I love. It says, when through fiery trials... Thy pathway shall lie. My grace, all sufficient, shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume, thy gold to refine. In the book of Daniel, it tells the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We call them the Hebrew children. They're in Babylon. They'd been taken captive from Israel and and there they were commanded to bow down and to worship an idol. And they would not do it. They simply wouldn't do it. They, they didn't debate it. They didn't agonize over it. They didn't question it. They didn't ask for prayer about it. They just, no, we don't, we don't do that. And so they were accused and they were convicted. And they were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And they said, we know that our God can deliver us. From the flames of the furnace. But if not, we still will not bow the knee. And so they were, it describes in detail how they were bound. They put ropes on them. Nebuchadnezzar had the furnace heated seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before. It was so hot that it says they did it so quickly. They didn't take adequate precautions. And the men the servants who threw them into the furnace were killed by the blast. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put into the, the furnace. And sometime later, 
Nebuchadnezzar comes to a place where he can see into it, and he sees not three, but four. And he says that the fourth one looks like a son of God. And it says he saw them unbound. I love that detail. When they, when they came out, it says that there wasn't even the smell of smoke in their clothes. The only thing that burned off of them was what the world put on them, the ropes. And it just might be that when you suffer the fiery trial of your faith, that the things that you lose are things you really didn't need to begin with. They were things that bound you and kept you from faithfulness. You might lose a job, but perhaps that job and the success that went with it would have taken you further away from Christ instead of closer to his heart. You might lose friends, but perhaps those friends would become an idol in your heart You'd care more about them than about Christ. I, I don't know what you have lost, what you might lose, but I know this. The only thing the world can take away from you is what the world has given you. The, the world can't take away from you anything God has given you. You need to pray that you will have sanctification that makes you like Christ when you go through the trials. And Pray for sharing with Christ. In verse 13, it says, Peter says, Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. You, you share in His sufferings. The good news is one day you're going to share in His glory. Pray that when you share Christ's sufferings, when you share His joy, when you share His glory, that you, you come to know the deep fellowship with Jesus that comes no other way. Paul said in Philippians 3.10 that his great desire was that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. How do you know the power of his resurrection? Being made like him in his sufferings. See, there's something that even God can't do. He can't give you resurrection until first you die. And in all the history of the world, there's never been a resurrection unless there was first a death. You have to die to self. You have to die to some things in your life so that God can show you the power of resurrection, make you like Jesus. Those Hebrew children we mentioned, they learned something you need to learn. That is that when you get into the furnace for Jesus, you'll also get into the furnace with Jesus. He's not going to lead you anywhere where he is not. No one else knew that kind of fellowship but those guys. Pray. Pray also for satisfaction in Christ. In verse 14, he says, If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. Now, who is the spirit of glory and God that rests upon you? Well, that's the Holy Spirit. And when you have the Holy Spirit, you can be totally satisfied because you're learning an intimacy and a sufficiency that you cannot get any other way. And pray for seeming like Christ. Because when you suffer as a Christian, you look like Jesus. We follow a crucified Savior. It should not be lost on us that Jesus, in his glorified body in heaven, has retained his earthly scars. Remember when he, he saw Thomas? Thomas had doubted, and Jesus still had the wounds. He said, here, Thomas, reach out your hand and stick it in the wound of my side. Put your fingers in the wounds in my hand. And throughout all of eternity, Jesus retains the, the wounds, the scars that he had on Calvary as a testimony of what he has done for us. And when we suffer as Christians, when we go through the fiery trial, when this world even crucifies us, we 
we look like him you have a trust and obedience you see the big picture because there's a joy set before you the same way jesus endured the suffering of the cross for the joy that was set before him and bringing many sons to glory the only way he could guarantee our salvation was to die for us so i want you to look honestly at the suffering in your life no doubt there's some suffering there because you brought it on yourself it's the result of your sin when i suffer for my sin first thing i need to do is repent i i, I need to confess my sin to the lord lord i i'm sorry i've sinned against you i'm sorry that my life did not reflect the character of christ in this instance you know the good news is you aren't defeated by that jesus blood is greater than your sin and he loves you and he'll forgive you but when you repent you also need to take responsibility don't blame god because of your sin don't blame others because of your sin yeah you don't know this man i'm married to you don't know what i put up with at work no no excuses you take responsibility for your sin accept the consequences of your sin understand the principle of sowing and reaping but if you will in your repentance truly seek christ if you'll be open with people about your own brokenness about the bad choices you've made and and say you know here's the good news god has forgiven me that and i am pursuing him with everything in me yes i messed up but you know more than anything now i want to serve and honor the lord jesus christ and the devil tries to tell me i can't serve because of that but i i know that i can if you will just walk the long, hard road of repentance, and it is long, it is hard, and just honor the Lord, you know what happens? Then your repentance becomes more notorious than your sin. And when someone tells what you did, someone else says, wow, that's, that's amazing because that, she's one of the most godly people I know. Well, that, that guy, he is such a Christ-like man. That's right. You just keep honoring the Lord. You keep serving the Lord. You accept responsibility and take the consequences of your sin. But live and walk in repentance and let your repentance be more notorious than your sin. And in all things, whatever kind of suffering you're in, whether it be suffering that's the result of the fall, suffering that's a result of your sin, suffering that's a result of your walk with Christ. In all things, glorify God. Peter says it here that, that you should glorify God. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So in private, in your most private moments before the Lord, acknowledge to him that you trust him. Paul said it in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. He said, I take pleasure in weaknesses and in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. When you understand the way God uses your weakness. He uses your suffering. He, he uses your problems. And you just lay that out before him alone with the Lord Lord, I want to glorify you in this. Help me to live for you in this. But in public, acknowledge to others that you follow him. And so when you suffer, you suffer as a believer. You let that draw you closer to Christ. And you may not understand why it happened. God's never promised to tell us why. You may still grieve and hurt and sorrow over it, but if you take it to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to live out this suffering as a, as a believer, as a follower of Christ, I want others to see that in spite of this in my life, I follow you. How do you do that? Hey, well, first of all, through baptism. What is baptism if not a picture of the death of Jesus? Jesus. 
It's a picture of your willingness to die with him. It's a picture of your future hope that even when your body dies, you'll be resurrected. Your baptism is the very first way that you show that you follow Christ. In public, you acknowledge him through your church membership. You need to be a part of a church that stands on the truth of the Word of God. You, you need to be a part of a church that isn't going to fold and bend and, and break because the culture changes. You need to acknowledge you follow Him through your consistent witness. When Paul and Silas were suffering in jail, they had been beaten and thrown in jail. They were praising God and singing hymns. And when the earthquake hit, the Philippian jailer knew to turn to them. What must I do to be saved, he asked. And when people see you suffering, and in your suffering there's a joy and a trust and an obedience to Christ, and then sorrow and suffering comes in their life, they know who to turn to. They'll ask you, what must I do to be saved? God will use your suffering. Saul of Tarsus stood and heard a, a deacon named Stephen preach the gospel even to the point of them stoning him. And as he was being stoned and his life was leaving him, his face glowed with joy. And there was an obvious trust in him. And Saul never got over that until he met the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. God used Stephen's suffering. What did Peter say in the first part of chapter 3? He said, wives are to live this way before their lost husbands. So that even when you, when you suffer the indignity of a man who does not value the Christ that you serve, and you use that for the Lord, God uses it so that he can be one without a word. You acknowledge him in constant praise. Your life becomes one big praise session. Now, I don't know what suffering you're enduring. I don't know what you're facing. But I know that God is using it to direct you toward Him, not away. Satan wants to convince you to turn and go the other way. Satan wants you to think that somehow it's better to be without Christ and to enjoy this world. And he, he conveniently forgets to remind you that there's a greater suffering coming than anything this world knows. But today, if God's speaking to your heart, if He's dealing with you about whatever suffering you're going through, whether it be because you're in a fallen world, because of your own sin, because of persecution following Christ, you let that direct you toward Him. And if the world stands and points an accusing finger at you and says, you don't fit, say, so that's right, I'm an outsider uh, because this world's not my home. I live for an audience of one. And the only thing worse than receiving the world's suffering is receiving its applause. <laughs> 